Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to send that out. I will also send out a recording of um, this uh, webinar today so that you have that in case somebody misses it. They are all available on our Game and Parks uh, YouTube channel, and so I'll send that link as well. But again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us all year um, during this Lunch and Learn educational topic webinar. I uh, really enjoyed learning from everybody and, and um, hearing and being a part of a lot of really cool discussions. And just a little heads up for next year. Um, so when I when I send an email tomorrow, I will send the uh, press release for all the subjects and dates and then the registration links for all for at least the first six months of 2022. Some of those exciting topics are going to include um, talking about effective evaluations. We're going to hear from some Game and Park staff on what are evaluations, why are they important to programs and to projects. Um, we're going to talk about learning through inquiry, so the power of asking better questions. We're going to talk about conservation storytelling through visual media, uh, we're talking about building educational programs, what is behind the scenes and actually building those things. Um, we're going to be hearing um, from some folks at University of Nebraska about communicating science in the misinformation era. That will be a really good one. And also we'll be hearing um, from some other experts at U UNL about um, play, the value of early childhood education and play. So a lot of really exciting topics that I definitely look forward to learning more about. I'll send that out to everybody um, after today. But for today, you're all here to hear from Allie May. She's our Community Science Outdoor uh, Education Specialist here in the Fish and Wildlife Education Division. And she's gonna speak about community science and kind of a, what, what is it? How is it important to our agency? And a lot of um, really cool projects that we're part of and, and she's part of as well. So Allie, I'm gonna give it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone has questions during our presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. If they're kind of on topic and we have some pauses, we'll ask them, we'll answer them throughout. Otherwise, we will have some time at the end to answer your questions. Okay, thanks everybody. Great, thank you, Amber. All right, so um, as we get started, I would just love it if everybody could write what they think of when they hear of community science. So like, what would your definition be of community science? And if you've never heard of it before, that's okay. Um, just say what you think it sounds like. So getting started, my role at Gaming Parks is the community science education specialist. Um, and my background is I have an uh, undergrad in ecology and evolution. Um, and I, always wanted to do research, right? So I was like, I did this biology degree, I'm gonna do this research, it's gonna be great. And then I went to um, my first internship after college and I fell in love with environmental education. I fell in love with telling people about the science that I loved. Um, and that brought me to community science, right? So this interest in research and this love for community science, I found both of those things in community science. Um, so my first community science project that I worked on was the um, Neighborhood Nest Watch project with the Smithsonian um, Migratory Bird Center. And so it was this cool project where we went to people's backyards with banded birds and they reported these banded birds, um, color banded birds back to the Smithsonian. And it was this really individual project where you're literally in somebody's space, you're in their backyard you're doing the science in front of them, they're involved with it, they're helping set up nets, they're looking and observing, they're seeing, they're telling you about the birds nesting in their, their area. So it's this really intimate project. And I just found that really um, inspiring. And it was also the first place that I realized that community science had a huge impact on stewardship later on. So there was this lovely bridge between people being like, oh, this science is really cool and I really love birds. And then going to, oh, how can I help birds? Like, what can I do to better support the birds that I'm helping research? Um, so I went on and I got my master's in education and I actually focused on community science in Nebraska specifically. So I'm really excited to have this position. Um, so some topics we'll cover today. I just wanna kind of walk through what is community science, some background information you might wanna know about it. Um, and then we'll jump into some platforms. You know, there's lots of really great platforms we use to collect community science data on a large scale. And then I'm gonna to speak to some of the community science projects here in Nebraska. 
And then we're just going to have a little discussion about community science in, at um, Damon Parks. Like, why is it important? How can we use it? Um, in what ways can we weave it into our work? So starting off, Amber, what are some of those definitions we had for community science? We had some, some good ones. Um, Jane mentioned getting interested people involved in collecting information. It's a good one. Um, I liked Amanda's uh, doing cool stuff, which I definitely agree that's a part of it. And then um, Cody mentioned using or allowing the public to do real and meaningful scientific studies. Um, Sean mentioned non-formal scientists helping science. Those are all really great definitions. Yeah. Um, I do, woo, we just went through a speed read there. Um, I do especially love Amanda's though. That is 100% accurate. It's doing really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, community science, first of all, has a few different names that it's known by. So citizen science is a really common term used for community science. It's also participatory research. Um, crowdsourcing data. So there's several names that are kind of talking about the same thing, um, which is the practice of engaging people of different backgrounds and experience levels to participate and collaborate in scientific research. And so community science as a field, as it grows, is really trying to um, do two things. It's one is education and engagement. And the other is rigorous science. And we're trying to do both of those things um, with the practice of community science. I wanted to take you through the history just really briefly of community science, just to let you know it's not, it's not a new thing, right? People have been doing community science for a very long time. So in China, um, citizens and officials have been documenting locust outbreaks for the last uh, 3,500 years. In Japan, they've documented cherry blossom blooming times for 1,200 years. Um, wine growers in France have been documenting the harvest of their grapes for the last 650 years. So a lot of phenology um, documentation has been done historically. And then the Christmas bird count, which is something I think is a pretty familiar community science project has been happening in North America for over 100 years. And it's just created a plethora of data um, that researchers can then look at and see trends of um, birds, populations. Um, and then I really like this example. So this guy, William Hewell, coordinated thousands of people in nine nations and colonies on both sides of the Atlantic in a um, synchronized method of uh, measuring tides. So there were over 650 tidal stations um, that volunteers followed the methodology um, to measure the tides every 15 minutes around the clock um, during the same two-week period. And this all happened in 1835. So <laughs> that's a huge feat to undertake and to carry out um, efficiently and effectively. So the volunteers in the Great Tide Experiment, as it was called, included dockmen, officials, harbor masters, um, military men, surveyors, and then also just amateur observers. And then the participants did more than just collect data. Um, they also helped create uh, graphs and, and charts that William, sorry, William then used to assemble um, maps and, and charts of the tides. So I just think this is a super impressive example, but I also want to put the question to you um, that how in 1835 was historically happening that allowed William Hewell to um, complete this experiment successfully. Is this a history quiz? This is, this is just, it's kind of a human dimensions question. Kind cool. of history. It's like, what was happening during that time period that allowed one, one man to be able to have 650 tidal stations um, and, and people to man them? No internet or social media to communicate. Do you have any thoughts about it? Okay, I'll just tell you. Okay. It was colonization, y'all. <laughs> like, <laughs> the reason it could happen is because he was, he was in, um, he was part of the the ruling empire of the day and had that 
social standing to be able to dictate this experiment. Still super duper um, impressive that he was able to do this, especially in light of uh, limited communication abilities and slow commu communication. But um, yeah, I just think it's always important to look at our, our history along with how we are doing science. Um, and then I also really love this example. So in the, in the 1940s through the 1960s, um, I always butcher this name, but bear with, with me now. Um, Jörg Hartz uh, was a research team. It was a man and wife, and they studied monarch um, butterflies, and they started the tagging of monarch butterflies, so giving those monarchs the, the little stickers with the numbers on them, um, trying to figure out where they went in, in the wintertime. They, they didn't know, and so they had thousands of naturalists that they trained um, to help them tag butterflies. And so another thing they were looking for at the time was the wintering grounds of the butterflies, because they also didn't know that. They didn't know where they went, and they didn't know um, how they got there, as in, was it the same individual going from, um, you know, the place in North America to Mexico, or was it um, generational? They had no idea. And so with this tagging effort, um, there was a monarch tagged in Minnesota. Um, when they found those wintering grounds, finally in Mexico, the husband and wife team spotted a, the butterfly that was tagged in Minnesota um, there in the wintering grounds among millions of other butterflies. And then they were able to know for the first time that monarchs indeed migrated, same generation from all the way in Minnesota down to, to Mexico. And that of course is still a project we do today, tagging um, monarch butterflies and Cody, uh, Dreyer, who's on this call right now, uh, kind of heads up that effort for Gaiman Park. So if you're interested in that, shout out to Cody, um, get a hold of him. All right, so when you're talking about community science, I kind of wanted to take you through the, the approaches to developing a community science project. So there's kind of three that I like to outline. One is top down. So this is kind of thinking about a researcher or institution being at the top and, and developing the but, you know, they have the question, they develop the methods, and then they are requesting help um, then to maybe collect the data, maybe collect the data and help analyze the data. Maybe, you know, it can be different ways it looks, but it's being driven by a central, a central entity or a limited number of entities, right? So top down. Bottom up would be um, community science driven. So I meant community science. Um, so this would be a person who is an amateur scientist or doing something just because they're interested in it, who develop this question and then they go about finding the answer to it. So they would set up the methods and then maybe pull in partnerships from experts, but they're really driving the project. And then the one that I love the most and would like to see more of is collaborative community science project development, um, where it's kind of more equal leadership. So it's the people, it's the people in the places of um, expertise, we'll say, and then the people who maybe are from the community and have these questions working together to create methods and then building the project up from there. Um, and then types of community science projects, just so we kind of have some common language, um, we're going to talk about passive and active. So passive projects are something like iNaturalist, which we'll talk about a little later. You can set up a project and it's just collecting data. It's collecting data that people might not even be putting on there specifically for that project. It's just being pulled in. So the pros of passive projects are it's less time and energy to run, less resources to run most of the time. Um, and it's good for, for getting kind of a preliminary or baseline data set. Um, the cons is it's, it's less detailed uh, data often, there's less rigor to the research being done, um, and there's less and limited interaction with any participants, so you're, you're not getting as much of that engagement. And then there's active, so active would be like um, Cody, once again I'm shouting out to Cody because he's here, um, his rare butterfly surveys is a very active project, so there's somebody running the project, there's time devoted to it, um, there's training of volunteers, there's rigor in the scientific questions and studies, the methods, um, and there's more engagement happening and oftentimes more collaboration as well. Um, so one of the cons to this kind of 
project is it's more involved. So there's more time, energy, and resources needed um, to effectively run those types of projects. So now I wanna pose another question to you. How do community scientists benefit research projects? So why would we pull in um, amateur scientists to help us run research? Just gonna give you about 30 seconds to pop something in the chat. Cody mentioned way more data. Darren mentioned local knowledge. Yeah, absolutely, Darren. Uh, Sean said increase sample size and Christy Christensen said save money. Yeah, those are all right on. You're hitting the nail on the head there. And Jane make, makes people care. Yeah, like absolutely. So yeah, it totally increases project power. So you're collecting, a, you have the ability to collect a lot more data. You have a lot more people out there, eyes on the ground, um, collecting data than if you just had, you know, a handful of technicians helping you with a project. Um, also, oftentimes community scientists have access to locations we don't have access to. So um, think about like collecting data from people's backyards or from private lands or whatever it is. Um, oftentimes they can go places that we, we might not have as easy of time gaining access to. Um, People also, you know, you're having, you're recruiting people with different backgrounds and interest levels and knowledge. Um, and so they can bring in a historic knowledge and insight that the researcher themselves might not have. Um, new and alternate, uh, alternative perspective. So bringing in, you know, sometimes I'm just, I'm just saying, sometimes we can get a little, um, we're focused on something, we're narrow and we're not maybe seeing everything that somebody with an outside perspective can see. Um, it helps that engagement piece helps increase scientific literacy, which can in turn help increase the ownership and support that people have either of the, the um, object of your study. So if you're studying a species, and this is a great way to get people to care about that species and advocate for it. And then, like I said earlier, it can increase that can turn into stewardship, right? Stewardship action. So once you get somebody to care about um, something like bees, then they're going to take that next step and figure out how they can um, then support those bee populations, right? Okay, so are all projects suitable for community science? What do you think? Are all projects suitable for community science? We got some resounding no's from Sean and Amanda, and that's absolutely right. No, all projects are not suitable for community science. And so that's both on the, on the side of, um, methodology, like this method, the methods that we need to do to collect this data are not appropriate for public engagement. Um, there's also sometimes, you know, sensitive subjects that we, or uh, subjects that require a lot more knowledge than others, um, just like background knowledge in order to be able to do the research effectively. There's lots of reasons why projects aren't suitable for community science. So it's not a one size fits all. Um, Sean, Sean kind of asked, but the vast majority could be, or maybe we'll we'll speak to that. Yeah, so I think that that's a that's a great point, Sean, and I really think it depends on the the um, goals of your project, right? So, um, and the the time, you know, there's just so many factors that go into it. Um, it's goals, it's timeline, it's resources, um, it's the type of data that you need to collect and how you need to collect it and where. Um, but I do think a lot more research is suitable for community science than we currently give credit for. Absolutely. So that kind of brings us to when should we do community science then? So if we have a project and we're thinking about like, how can I complete this? Is community science a good fit? Um, I think there's three big things you can think of. One, does community science benefit the research that you're going to do? So do, does um, volunteer support help the project and, and can it be done in a way that produces usable data? Um, the second would be the opportunity to engage. So 
So we've talked a little bit about like the shared ownership, the increase in advocacy, um, and a huge increase in understanding your topic. Um, those are all really good things, but do you, do you have the power to support that? Um, so successful, the most successful community science projects have built in support for volunteers. So they have someone who's dedicated to training and to answering questions and to really building that community of volunteers that's needed to um, complete the project. Are there any questions around this? All right, so we're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and we're gonna go into some platforms you should know about. So these are just some common platforms used in community science um, that I think that are very relevant to game and parks, right? Um, so I, I'm asking the question, do you like nature? Do you like nature? Do you like um, observing nature? Maybe you take a lot of wildlife pictures or you work, um, you like to find species and identify things you don't know. Um, a great community science platform would be iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is an app, it's also a web page that allows you to take images or sound clips of your observations, upload them to this app, and then there's both AI technology and there's um, crowdsourcing of the identification of those observations. And this is a common platform used for a variety of collection projects. So like we would like to collect sightings from this time and this place, right? Okay, so you like nature and you like science and you like history, um, but you wanna participate from your desk or couch or bed, right? So then you might wanna try um, Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is a platform with a huge variety of projects, um, both dealing with history and medicine and uh, there's space projects. There's also a ton of camera trapping projects on there. Um, and essentially people can go on, pick a project and do a quick tutorial and then start helping identify what they're seeing in the images. Um, and so we do have a project called Nebraska Wildlife Watch um, that was started a few years ago, which we'll talk about in a little bit that's being kind of revamped for a new study. Um, and I also just want to point out that a recent study of the Zooniverse project, Michigan Zoom In, showed that the crowdsourced ideas were around 97% accurate. Um, and then the er errors that were occurring, the researchers um, could tell were coming from like similar species. So for example, it was wolves and coyotes were one of the common ones. And so even though it was 97% uh, accurate, um, the errors were coming from somewhere where the, the researchers could easily know those errors were recurring and then double check that, those things, instead of having to go through the entire data set, right? This is, uh, Zooniverse though is a really fun platform to play around on and see the different types of projects. Okay, do you like birds, specifically birds, right? You might wanna try eBird. So eBird is a great platform um, that allows you to essentially create lists of all the birds you see um, and then associate those with a time and, and um, place. And then eBird is also really cool for finding birding locations too. So you can find where people, other people have been seeing birds. Um, and there's starting to be a bigger community aspect to this part of the project as well. All right, so you like birds, but you, you're new to birding. You don't know that much about birding. Um, there's this really cool app called Merlin, which is also from Cornell, just like eBird. Um, and Merlin takes you through the identification of birds, um, either through kind of this step-by-step -step process like you see here, or through um, sound bites now, and also images that you take. They have some AI technology that can help you narrow down what it is you're looking at. Um, and then the really cool thing about Merlin is recently they've connected to eBird. So you can use Merlin as your main app while also now collecting that eBird data. All right. I do have a quick question and it has to do with Zooniverse. Yeah. Really quick. Um, Cody asked, uh, was the 97% ID after the pictures looked at, was it by multiple people or just the total flat rate? Yeah, that's a great question, Cody. So it was at, um, they were looking at the total after it had been looked at by 
by multiple people. So um, with Zooniverse, Cody's bringing up a really great point. There's this aspect where you can, um, you can set your images to be looked at by one person, or you can set it to be looked at by um, 20 people. And there's been some studies done that have shown that, you know, having it looked at by this multiple people are, is eliminating that error, that range of error. Okay, so you like bees, not so into birds, but you like the bees. A really cool um, app you can use is Bumblebee Watch. So Bumblebee Watch is, uh, it was launched in 2014 and it works similarly to iNaturalist in the sense that you create an account and then you submit photos and then those um, photos are ID'd. It's different from um, iNaturalist in the fact that the photos ID'd are being ID'd by um, experts and it's not relying on crowdsourcing. Um, so the database or is Bumblebee Watch app is connected to the Bumblebee Bees of North America database. And in the last 10 years, 25% of all the records in that database have come from the app. So have come from the community scientists. Okay, and this is just an example of a user profile, which I always like um, because this is my favorite part of the Bumblebee app, just on a side tangent, is you get to go on there and then you get to see all the cute bees that you've seen. It's like your life list of bees. It's adorable. All right, so you like reptiles and amphibians. Um, you could report to iNaturalist. That's totally a great way to report those, but we also have the UNL's report a sighting, um, which is set up as a form and you can submit images along with it. And the reason we're kind of encouraging this for reptiles and amphibians um, specifically is the fact that um, the fact that there has been some studies showing that uh, pet traders have been using iNaturalist to find where reptiles and amphibians are um, to then go take from the wild. So we, um, we are now suggesting that people use the report of sighting over iNaturalist for the reptiles and amphibians. All right, any questions about some of those, those platforms we talked about? I'm really curious if people if if people are really familiar with a lot of those or or um, if if you just learned some cool new ones today that maybe you haven't heard of. I don't know. But other than that, there's no question. Oh, Mel said she uses iNaturalist and Merlin, and Jane said she loves the B one but has never heard of it. So that's awesome. Amanda loves iNaturalist. I also love iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. Just jumping on that train. Yay. Cool. Okay, so community science in Nebraska. Um, this is just kind of a overview of some of the projects we have going here. So the first one I'm talking about is Cody's project. I mean, Cody, do you just want to unmute and talk about your own project? I don't want to take that from you. No? Okay. Um, so the, the NGPC rare butterfly surveys is looking at monarch and regal fritteraries um, and also looking at associated plants. And they do this with a um, transect survey and training is required for this project. So this is a more active project. The contact is Cody um, and he's had, he's had quite a bit of success with the, with the project. Um, a hun so out of 220 transects surveyed, um, 104 of those were done by his, his community scientists. So pretty cool. Uh, another one we have going in Nebraska in partnership with UNL is the N Nebraska Amphibian Monitoring Network. Right now we're focusing on tiger salamanders and we are, um, our protocol are currently, are currently staining for adults in those um, seasonal pools of water. Um, and then the data is uploaded directly through the UNL um, per portal that I spoke of just a moment ago. Um, but the goal is for this project is to grow it to be looking at more amphibians than just the salamanders. But for now, um, we're just looking for those. 
And then we have the NGPC turkey food surveys. So this happens from July to August, and we're just asking people to um, provide information on incidental observations. So no training is required. This would be considered kind of a passive project. Um, and the contact for this is Luke Maduna over in Wildlife. And then we have the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. The Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas has been a very successful project in, um, well, in Nebraska, but also in other places around the country where they've um, had it going. It uses it as a grid cell method, um, so splitting the state, state into grid cells, and then people essentially adopt a grid, a grid cell in order to do a survey there. Um, so prairie frolicking is required for this project, if that's something that interests you. Um, the contact for this project is Katie Lamke with the Xerces Society. Then we have Tic Tac Go from UNL, and they're just, they're trying to get a baseline of what ticks are, are currently in the state, and then to see if any changes happen in the next few years. So it's thought that there are thoughts that new ticks are going to start moving into Nebraska, so they're just trying to monitor that. To do that, they use um, an iNaturalist project, and a good contact for that project is Louise Lynch O'Brien. We also have the Nebraska Fungal um, Diversity Survey ran by the Nebraska Mycological Society through uh, iNaturalist. Y'all, I can't talk today. What's happening? I'm stumbling over my words. Um, so many cool projects to talk about. Oh, I know. I'm just, I guess it's excitement. I'm just like, uh -huh. I forgot how to speak. Uh -huh. um, luckily, I have all this information on the slide for you. So if you can't understand me. Um, the iNaturalist project for the fungal diversity runs into um, Fungdis, which is a international uh, data collection point for the project. And Chance is with Nebraska Game and Parks. He doesn't do this project for Game and Parks. Um, and so the contact information would be this Gmail account right there. But if you haven't checked out the Nebraska Mycological Society yet, I would recommend it. They just formed last year. So they're having their one year anniversary this year and they've already done a lot of cool things. I also hear that Chance is a pretty fun guy. <laughs> I, I, I had to, okay. Moving on, okay. um, bio blitzes are something that we do here uh, at Game and Parks. And They've been happening for quite a few years in the state parks. So Buffalo Bill is one that participates and then Shadron and Wildcat Hills also have annual, um, annual events. And then I also throw in our bird month blitz that Jamie Bachman coordinates and then the pollinator week challenge with these kind of bio blitz events as well. Um, so bio blitz events is, it's essentially collecting biodiversity data. So what species live in a certain area um, and a great, way to run a uh, BioBlitz project is to utilize that iNaturalist platform for data collection. If you have questions about this project, um, there's lots of people in the agency that help with these programs, um, but if you just have general questions, you can go ahead and reach out to me. And then the City Nature Challenge, if you want to like take BioBlitzes and extrapolate it into a global scale, um, that would be the City Nature Challenge. So it's a global effort to collect urban biodiversity data. So in 2021, there were over 400 cities that participated and over a million observations. And Nebraska, um, you know, we reported 2,000 of those. So pretty good. <laughs> it also uses that iNaturalist platform. It's currently in Lincoln and Omaha, but we'll talk about um, the growth of this project in just a few minutes. And then I just want to point out, we do have the Community Scientists of Nebraska Network. So this network is committed to increasing the awareness and participation of community science across the state. Um, there is a project directory that's being currently built. And then also the we have a listserv that we use to push out information about community science in the state. Um, our social media handle is the same across both Facebook and Instagram. And we are currently planning a regional section of the Citizen Science Association's um, International Conference, which will be happening in May. So that's something to look forward to um, next year. Okay, so community science and NGPC. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about some of the things looking ahead that we're working on currently. Um, so we are working on putting out a Nebraska Lady Beetle project in partnership with Shadron State College. 
this is going to be a more passive project to begin with. We're going to see, we just want to get an idea of what kind of data we can start collecting and then potentially grow the project into a more active project from there. Um, Nebraska Wildlife Watch, which I spoke about earlier, is a Zooniverse project. Um, and in partnership with UNO, there's a study going on with, um, looking for Eastern spotted skunks. And so it's a camera trap project. We're going to run those camera trap images through Nebraska Wildlife Watch. Um, so that should be launching the beginning of next year. We also have the City Nature Challenge. We're going to three new cities in um, Nebraska this year. So Norfolk, North Platte, and Scotts Bluff will be included. Um, and then in addition to doing those local, those local like in-person events, we're also going to be having some um, statewide virtual events leading up to it in partnership. Um, so five cities will be included in that this year. I'm also working with parks to develop this biodiversity and state parks project. Um, so that's kind of thinking about our state park um, bio blitzes, but thinking about it more in a way of like, how can we collect this data um, of people who are already going into the parks, already making um, observations on iNaturalist and just collect it in a way that might be useful to parks. Um, we're looking at urban wildlife in partnership with UNL. That project's a little um, undefined currently, um, but we're hoping to, it'll be another camera trap project that um, we're hoping to have community scientists help with. Um, and then also we're working on community science curriculum. So we're creating offerings for K through 12 educators uh, to use in the classroom or in an informal setting. Um, so we have one currently working on for birds and then we have another one we hope to be working on soon for um, camera trapping. Okay, so this all brings us to how does community science fit into uh, game and park. So I just kind of want to open it up. You can unmute yourself. You can throw it in the chat, but I want to get your thoughts on how does this um, field of study, how does community science fit into game and parks as a whole, or how does it even fit into your position, um, your role within game and parks? Hey, Ellie, this is Ted. I'll ask a, it's more of a question though for you. Sure. Um, nice job on your presentation. Um, you know, we've been working with, uh, one thing you haven't mentioned is master naturalists. Yeah. A lot of community science, but also, for instance, we're working with them on helping to improve our weather here at the Game and Parks headquarters. And I guess I wonder where the, how you classify community science versus community conservation, you know, where someone's helping with land management or improving a trail or helping with signage that sure. there's a component, but it's not collecting necessarily biological data. And yeah, so I think um, community science is collecting usable data um, would be the, dif the difference, right? So um, stewardship and volunteering and, and that sort of work is is very good and I'm glad it's happening, um, but community science is actually that collecting of data that is then going to be used for a purpose, right? Does that, does that make sense, Ted? Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, and yeah, just wanted a little clarification on that, but, but also then master naturalists, we have been using them to, I know for- Yeah, so I- Actually collect with, the data. Um, master naturalist, the master naturalist trainings, I do a community science se session at each training. Um, and then Matt Jones, who is the coordinator for Master Naturalist, is also mm -hmm. on the Community Scientists of Nebraska um, core group. So helping kind of direct that involvement. So Master Naturalists are definitely one of um, our audiences for community science. It's definitely a wonderful pool of people to pull from um, to get volunteers for these different types of projects. And master naturalists also have community science built into their um, hours. So one of the categories of volunteer hours that they have is community science. Okay, thanks, Allie. Sure.
Um, and, and Cody mentioned it's, you know, asking about community science, how does it fit in? And he said it's 90% of what he does, which is exciting. And Jane mentioned it's a great way to get people engaged in the outdoors. And I know, um, Jane, and, you know, that speaks to what we try to do here at Kingman Parks at large, too. So it's a great avenue for that. So good answers. Hey, it's uh, Sean. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of asked how this fits in. And, and I know you mentioned the Spotted Skunk Project. And I was super excited to have the uh, community science portion of that because I think right now, as, as I told you the other day, we're, we're looking at uh, over 10,000 pictures uh, that we've already collected and, and we're just beginning this project. And so to have uh, like Zooniverse on board to help people go through that. And then also to have, you know, uh, community members across the state, you know, potentially putting out uh, their camera traps to help with this effort uh, is just a huge boost to this project and, and really just multiplies the effect of what we were trying to do with this project, because otherwise it was going to be just me or just the student at UNO. And to add in all those people and all that help is really going to benefit this project and help us learn so much more about what's going on with this species. So um, it really is, is a huge help. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so much for sharing that. I'm really excited about it too, about the Spotted Skunk Project. That was something that um, I had started to work on when I was in the watchful wildlife position. So I'm glad that I still get to be a part of it. Um, I forgot to tell you all a story. Do you want a story really quick about lady beetles? Honestly, I was going to mention that, but I didn't want to interrupt. It was in, Please tell me the story. It was in my notes and I okay. just skipped over okay. it. So that was one of my favorite stories. Um, story time. So once upon a time, there was a, a lady named Allie Mays, and she was in western Nebraska doing community science on bumblebees, and she just so happened to find this ladybug right here. And she was like, oh, that's interesting. That doesn't look like anything I've seen before. And so she took a picture of it, and then she like tossed it, and she didn't think about it again until a couple months later, and she was like, oh, what is this lady beetle? Nobody on iNaturalist knows what it is either. So she contacted um, Matt Brust at Shadron State College. And she was like, what is this? Is this a nine spotted lady beetle? Cause that would be crazy. And Matt wrote back and he was like, no, this is not a nine spotted lady beetle. This is a prolongated lady beetle, which only has three records in the state. Um, one of which is yours. So from there I was sold and now we're doing a lady beetle project. There's more to it oh, than cool. that. Um, there's also like input from Carolyn and Melissa over in wildlife, but I'm just saying you get hooked in when you find something you don't know about. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is a really cool find. And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to do a lady beetle project. <laughs> so anyway. Great story. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Thanks. I was trying to liven it up a bit, but Carolyn, did I see your hand raised earlier? Uh, yes, can you tell me more about the Nebraska Wildlife Watch that you're going to be doing with the Spotted Skunk Project? Um, because currently we have like, have you seen me? Contact these people. Yeah, this so, yeah, so um, Nebraska Wildlife Watch was started when I was in the watchful wildlife position and we had a few cameras, we didn't have very many, we had a few cameras set up on um, BULs um, and we were just trying to find out what we could what we could find, uh, seeing if we could see anything. And spotted skunks were like a thought, but they weren't necessarily the main objective um, of that particular camera project. Um, and so we set up, hold on, I'm just gonna show you. One moment, please. We set up this project um, on Zooniverse to go through these camera trap images. And so essentially I set it up for everything that it could possibly be in, in the image. I'm trying to find an image that, you know, is exciting. 
like not blowing grass. Well, anyway, um, so there's, there's when you get onto the project that launches a tutorial, you go through the tutorial. It tells you how to, how to you know, what we're interested in and how to complete our um, workflow is what it's called. And then um, people can, can just log in and, and help us tag the images. Um, so this was kind of like the bones of it. And then in talking to Sean and April, who's the student working on the Spotted Skunk Research Project, um, they were talking about the influx of photos that they were going to have and the trouble of going through them. And so I suggested that this platform could be a really good way to do that. And so the images that are collected from the camera traps will be uploaded to the project. And we are currently working on setting up our parameters for that project um, to see exactly what we want to identify. Do we only want to identify um, skunks? Are we going to identify everything that's found? You know, whatever those parameters are, are decided upon. Um, and so the, the rate at which the images get um, reviewed and tagged is, is really, it's very quick, you know, in comparison to if one person was trying to do it by themselves or even a couple people. Um, does that answer your questions, Carolyn, or am I missing something? I feel like I started tangenting and now I don't know where I am anymore. That answers it. Okay, great. All right. Do we have any other questions or thoughts about community science? I'm just seeing a lot of people be really excited that you are uh, Lady Beetle famous in Nebraska. Lady Beetle famous. I mean, so, it's claim to fame, right? Mm -hmm. it's, if I was going to be famous big for anything, I would want it to be yeah. for something random like a Lady Beetle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's all I see. I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay, great. Well, if anybody has any questions um, or you know follow up thoughts or ideas that they would like to discuss, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll throw my email in the chat. Yeah, and as you do that, I, it's something just to keep in mind. You know, she listed all these different projects going on and all these different contacts going on. If the nice thing is, if you're not really sure, you know who's doing what, Allie is just an amazing resource, is just that point person. She might not be doing the project or the lead person on it, but she'll know, um, you know, who, who, who to help you, who to contact for you. So really amazing resource to have for our agency. We're so excited to have her, especially in our division. Sorry, I had to do that plug, Allie. Okay, I'm just going to sit here stone-faced. It's fine, sure. totally fine. Okay, thank you so much, Allie. That was incredible. Uh, it was a really good overview. Um, and I hope we all know a little bit more about it. Maybe we knew some of it and maybe we learned something. Um, it was a good discussion as well. So thanks everyone for participating and for sharing your thoughts and your questions. Um, I will send an email, hopefully by tomorrow, um, a quick evaluation, what you thought, anything you learned. And also I will try to link to at least uh, a few of these. Um, she shared a lot of resources today, but I'll link to a few of them. Um, if you don't see something in the email I send uh, that, you wanted to learn more about it, again, I'll, I'll share her contact information. You can reach out to her. But thank you so much for participating in Lunch and Learn this year. And I'm so excited about next year and all our topics and to keep learning together. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Allie, thank you so much. Bye.